I'm Mister. And this is Lore Together, because we like to lore together. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was really awkward. I'm sorry, audience. Dear audience, I apologize. We're recording this a little late. I'm a little punchy right now. <laughs> we won't get into that. We'll, we'll, we'll put this one up, warts and all. Why not? It'll be fun. Punch, 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 punch. <laughs> uh, this is episode five of Lore Together, and we're still in the middle of Elder Scrolls. I, I'm sorry, guys, but... Right now we're doing Daedra, right? That's the point. We'll be doing Daedra. I do want to cover a couple things first. Yes, um, yes. We have a friend on Twitter. Hello, friend. Aramithius, who Hi, is Aramithius. the person who does the Written in Uncertainty podcast. Hi. Which is, like, we're dipping our toe, scratching the surface of Elder Scrolls. Mm-hmm. His podcast is like, jump in and swim into the deep lore. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> let, let me describe it like this. Remember in the original Will, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory movie, when the kids go to the chocolate lake, and they are drinking from the chocolate lake, and they're only putting their hand in? That's what we're doing when it comes to Elder Scrolls lore. <laughs> He's a or Gustus any lore. He is a Gustus <laughs> Gloop. He has dived right right in, and he's going to need to get all that lore chocolate washed off of him, and it's going to taste like candy forever. Or, but I candy, I mean he's going to taste like it, You know, calling deep someone deep Augustus lore. Gloop might be considered an insult. You probably don't mean this of our friend. I, I'm. It's not an insult, Aramithius. It's more just... A description of how how much you love Elder Scrolls lore. You love it as much as Augustus Gloop loved chocolate. <laughs> and I think you'll be smart enough to not get caught in the river right. machine. Um, there's a couple of things he pointed out that I did get kind of wrong. Last in, episode. Last two episodes. Last two episodes. Yeah, yeah. in episode one we were talking about when the... In not technically episode one because it's episode three of our podcast, but the first episode... Episode of... three and four of our podcast. Yeah. There, in episode three we talked about the gods judging Lorcan and his heart and all that stuff. I said there was the... I said the Adamantine Tower was in Cyrodiil. Mm-hmm. It is not. That is the white gold tower. It just looks the same, which is why I got confused. Oh. I saw a picture of the white gold tower. I forgot about the adamantine tower being the same look, so I okay. thought it was the same thing. It was the adamantine tower, which is over on Balfara Isle uh, in High Rock, so way to the northwest of Tamriel. Okay. Uh, so I got my towers confused there. Someday we'll get to the towers. It's 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 deep lore that he he digs into. We don't dig into yet. And that's kind of the other thing. Some of the other uh, points here are the Aedra and the Divines are not necessarily the same thing. I'm doing very broad strokes right now. We can get into the crunchy lore of the the Mer Pantheons and the Imperial Pantheon specifically. Mm-hmm. I'm just covering the ones that are kind of in the game that everybody sees. Okay. So I'm only kind of covering... I should explain a little bit about this podcast in general, I think, that some people may not understand. It's very, very general. And then it's kind of like painting with very broad strokes, and then continuing episodes will correct any Mm -hmm. of those misconceptions. Because I'm learning it, too, from the first time, usually, when I'm researching. Right, right, exactly. (laughs) And Elder Scrolls lore is complex. (laughs) It's all lore super is complex. complex. I mean, and that's why I leave it to the, to somebody like Mystic to to keep it together. Yeah. For instance, the Chimer and the Dunmer, and there's a lot of stuff about why the Chimer became the Dunmer. I didn't want to get into it all. That's part of it. I'm trying to avoid bogging everything down as much as possible. So this is kind of a streamlined version of the of essentially not only the creation but also the powerful figures within Elder Scrolls. We're not right. trying to get into all the minutia, because there's a lot of minutia that you could you could spend probably a whole podcast of ours talking about. You know, you know, tales like the, the was it the the lusty argar. The Lusty Argonian Maid, you could probably do a, a little bit on there. You could talk about all the different people who have it in their uh, in their possession, which implies that they're reading sultry erotica. Yeah, I mean that would be half of an episode for us. Right, so. It, some of the some of the crunchy parts and some of the stuff that I may get inconsistent, it's sometimes on purpose I'm getting it not 100% accurate just for the sake of people who are just learning it and not getting caught in all the details. Right. But if you if you are interested in this kind of lore, our Aramithius does a lot of work in, in really trying to get mm-hmm. it clear, concise, and super hyper detailed. So it's just a question of do you want a Monet or do you want an MC Escher? <laughs> and um, if you want the Monet, that's us. And I think the MC Escher is more kind of the people who are doing work like Aramithius. Or if you want to read up on your own, right. there's a lot more for you to delve. So we're just here to wet your palate 
And we're going to do that with a lot of the other, um, you know, not just, you know, mainstream games, but also at some point we'll do some indie games. Right. Uh, Those will be a little bit harder to research. There is one last thing he pointed out, and I somewhere, this is one that I should have actually not probably talked about. We Uh we mentioned the end of the last episode, the Thalmor and their goals and stuff. Oh. That is actually mostly a fan theory. It's not. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So apologies. That, yeah. yeah, that was I kind of took it. At, I was reading people's explanations of what the Thalmor are doing, and I thought they were explaining lore. They were explaining a fan theory. Oh, so, okay. But th- um, there's but, stuff to back it up. Obviously, that's why it's a fan theory. But and I, there's not much in the games to support the theory yet. I've definitely been in that position where I almost thought something was was going to be guaranteed lore, and it's just a fan, a fan. Fan theory. I, I, fan theory. Fa- I, the th is not what was going. I, fan theory. Anyway, fan theories sometimes are so good that you think they're lore. Say fan and theory three times fast. I don't want. <laughs> then something's gonna pop out the mirror, and I'm not even know who they are. <laughs> Ooh. So, all that being said, we will happily take corrections to stuff. We're, yes, please. So. Lore together at gmail.com. Feel free to reach out and let us know if there's anything. Or that, Twitter. You know, or Twitter at Lore Together. I try to keep up with that, and now I've had more energy to do it. So yay! Right. And uh, if you're on Reddit and you want to give me feedback, uh, usually you'll see me in the posts that I do for each episode, but also at you backslash Lore Together Pod. Yeah. So, but anyway, let's dive in. We have a lot to cover today. Uh, we're not going to cover all the Daedra. We will be back to it eventually. <laughs> but we're going to give you a breather, and we're going to do this is not in, some other lore after. Yeah, this, this is not an next Elder episode. Scrolls podcast. This is right. a video game lore podcast. This so. is an appreciation of all the writing of all kinds of video games. Uh, we already had someone wanting us to do uh, Sonic the Hedgehog lore, which ugh. we may pursue it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, if you're a patron oh. of ours, you can uh, request what we're going to cover in the future. So Yeah, and you'll get is, to see uh, our live streams as well, where we talk about what we might do in the future. Yep, mm-hmm. and uh, that would be patreon.com slash lore together. Yes. Anyway, all that all that done, let's move on to the Daedra. Daedra! Daedra! Daedra. So, again, I have mentioned this before, but Daedra sounds like demons. So I think when people first encounter them in the world, that's automatically what they're thinking of. Some of them look like it, and it's kind of the idea, too. Okay. Um, in some regards, you can kind of see that, especially with some of the Daedra. Uh, Daedra, the term, not our ancestors. It is a Merrick term, so it's an Elven term. Okay. Daedra can be used for both plural and singular. Mm, okay. Uh, although the latter is more correctly Daedroth. Daedroth. The reason you won't see people use that probably is there's also a species of Daedra, lesser Daedra, Uh specifically, called Daedroth. So... Daedroth sounds like a band that I want to start right now. Oh, it's this horrifying thing. I have, I saw it in Oblivion. It's this huge hulking, like, alligator shaped, like it had, it's like this humanoid thing with a giant alligator, like, type face on it and stuff. It's weird. The Daedroth sounds like a fantastic, like, hardcore metal band where they do that, that, like, horrible, (laughs) rough... Uh, Guttural... Guttural, like, yeah. was, I shouldn't call it horrible because I do like some heavy metal music, but it's horrible for your throat to keep doing that the rest of your yeah. life. That's why it's horrible. Um, so we're going to be covering only the major Daedra, what are called the Daedric Princes, because to cover all the individual Daedra and species and stuff would take a while. There's already 17 princes. There's 20 other lesser Daedra species as well. Ah, uh, <laughs> there's, this is, yeah. We're, yeah. We're so in... we're just covering the princes and we're covering half of them today. And the other so, half the next, next episode. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're, again, we're doing a broad introduction here. We're going to name the Daedra, give you all their names that people call them on all the different pantheons. We're going to talk about their plane of oblivion mm. and then some interesting stuff about them. Cool. So, and what they look like because Daedric princes. Now, are they all princes or are some of them? So, here's the thing about that in my notes are out of order. They're... Oh, sorry, I asked a question out of order. <laughs> That's fine. You're out of order. Safi You're never out of order. sees my my notes or Absolutely my script, not. so she doesn't know the order the stuff is in. Yeah. Um, this is very much a me being entertaining by reacting, and I hope I'm doing my job. <laughs> Daedric prince is the term, uh, but princes are, in actuality, genderless. They okay. can choose to be perceived how they want to be perceived and take what form they want. Oh, so they're like l- literally gender fluid, where gender fluid in current terms just means that yes. you kind of represent whatever you want when you're feeling it. 
And l I just have this image of, like, a Daedric prince being able to choose exactly their physical form and whatever gender they want or a yeah. combination of Most appear of consistently mm -hmm. as one or the other. They, okay. don't, they don't switch a lot. A couple do. Or they don't appear as something that would have gender. Oh, okay. I will probably use he for those just out of habit, but... Sorry, guys. And, and I do gals. apologize for that ahead of time. And non-binary pals. Yeah, I do not mean that, but it is just... Unfortunately, habit in my head still. Uh, Give us some patience, I guess. <laughs> and the problem is another thing that I... There are several different religious and cultural stories that explain the Daedra and their princes in different ways, making and how their creation came about and stuff. Okay. Making the distinction of what they are is kind of difficult to properly define, especially due to certain Daedra discrediting certain explanations. Some of that, Sometimes they are called Padomaic. As in Padme, if you remember way back when we talked about Padme and Anu, these two opposing forces. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but one of the Daedra princes, Merida, or Merida, I don't know how it was originally Merid Nuada, one of the Magna Gi, if you remember the Magna Gi, were the ones who left before the creation of Nern to create the sun and stars, mm -hmm. and they were Anuic, not Pedemaic. So okay. that already discredits that theory. Sometimes they are called the Atada, who did not take part in the creation of Nern, as I erroneously did. Malakath, one of the Daedra we'll be talking about, was once Trinimac, an Aedra, who was corrupted by Boethia, a Daedric prince. So Daedric prince basically turned him to quote-unquote the dark side with cookies or something. Um, <laughs> the corruption is often told as Boethia eating Trinimac Somebody's and in the and, and excreting Malakath. <laughs> that's definitely a vor. <laughs> and if you don't know what vor is, do not Google yeah, it. Yeah, that's not kid friendly. Do not, do not, do not Google it. I'm sorry. The, the important, the, the general thing to remember, generally speaking, it seems most people accept that the Atada who did not help create Mundus are the Daedra, Malakath being the exception. Malakath being the fecal exception. Yes. Uh, oh, God. They use their power to create their own planes of oblivion, so that took a lot less power than creating Nern, and they can kind of yeah. live in their own plane. If they go to Nern ever and die, Ooh. their spirit goes back to oblivion, into the void, and then they just get reborn. So they ah. don't die. <laughs> they regenerate. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of the broad strokes of the Daedra in general. Let's get into specifics now. And we'll go in mostly alphabetical order. There's one that I'm not going to do in alphabetical order. Okay. It so, makes sense for this one to be next time. So 17 of them. Yes. So we're going to go through eight, seven or eight of them now? Eight. Eight of them now? Yeah. Um, eight or, I, I should say more, eight or nine. I'm sorry. Yeah. I have more than that in here. I but, can do math, guys. I promise. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll start with... One that probably you've heard of before, Azura. Yeah. Azura, I believe so, yes. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, in your stream, yeah. you were seeing the Shrine of Azura in the distance there. Um, um, patrons at the $5 level can watch those, by the way. $3 level. $3 level? Excuse $3 level. me, $3 level. Um, I lied, $3 level. <laughs> and we would love people to come by and we can talk lore, we can talk what's going on in games and all yeah. that stuff. So, Everything. Uh, Azura, yeah. also known as Mother of the Roses. Mother Soul, Queen of Dusk and Dawn, Queen of the Night Sky. Okay. Her sphere is Twilight. Mm. Literally, the moment of change. Oh, okay. So not the awful series that everybody made fun of because it's just <laughs> really cheap trash um, romance. Right. So, and also Prophecy. I couldn't find a lot to really tie into that one, but also Prophecy. So, so, so which Prophecy is about big change anyway, right. so that makes perfect sense. Um, she is, her sphere is not change itself, though. That oh. is somebody else. This is literally the moment of change. The moment, so the precipice of change, yes. essentially. Uh, her plane is called Moonshadow. It is a garden full of roses, cities of silver, Moon breathtaking... Moonshadow is like the, the username of somebody on a really bad Twilight forum from ten years ago. This was written back when Daggerfall came out, which I think was in the late 90s. <laughs> Accurate. <laughs> oh, it's almost there, yeah. Um... At least I, th I believe that's when most of these were written. Most of these deities have pictures from, like, back in Daggerfall, and most of them are not accurate. Any Like, they're accurate, but they have better presentation and better looks. Right, as time goes on, yeah. Moonshatter is a giant garden full of roses, a city of silver, breathtaking vistas, brimming with waterfalls, flowers, trees, where wind and rain carry header perfume, and all the colors... Blur together. This is such a junior high school fanfic writer's <laughs> dream 
this is the kind of stuff, if I was not a sci-fi nerd in eighth grade, this is the kind of stuff I would have been The guy writing. herself resides in a palace of roses, so yeah, we're getting... This is some romance goth <laughs> BS going um, on right here. Oh my lord. It, literally, the line, one of the lines I saw that was great was, it is said the realm holds, holds such beauty that it makes mortals half blind if they see it. Oh. You know what else is Surprisingly reminds... only half blind, though. <laughs> only half blind. So it was like... Left eye or right eye? <laughs> yeah. She is worshipped by Dunmer and Khajiit particularly. Uh, we'll get to those we'll get to those when we do those race specific episodes. Mm -hmm. As well as we'll when we get to Morrowind, we'll get to her connection to the I don't remember how to pronounce this. Nereverine. Nereverine. The uh, so one thing that Bethesda does for their games, it seems, is every single protagonist is the something. Okay. Um, in Oblivion, you're the champion of Kvach. In Skyrim, you are the Dragonborn. Dovahkiin. In Fallout 3, you are the... I can't remember what you're called in Fallout 3. In New Vegas, you're the Courier. Yes. In Fallout 4, you're the Lone Survivor. Yes. So, in Morrowind, you are the Neverine. The Neverine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, she is known to be one of the more merciful and benevolent of the Daedric Lords. Okay. Her wrath is very swift. <laughs> If you do bring it about. <laughs> Thorns, passions, yeah, I yeah. can see that. Um, she is depicted feminine, obviously. Uh, a hooded flowing robe. Mm -hmm. It seems, from what I could tell, I won't, you can you don't see her in the games very often. She was seen in Morrowind, but the graphics are kind of <laughs> But from the statues that are in Skyrim, it looks like it's kind of like a weird, like, deep cut robe. Okay. But it's like attached to the wrists and stuff, and she has her arms stretched out uh, with a moon in her right hand and a sun in her left hand. So, Twilight. So that's Azura, Azura. and let's move on to Boethia, which is... Uh, some of these I haven't really delved a lot into, like Azura I knew, Boethia I kind of knew a little tiny bit about. Mm -hmm. We'll get to them all in time, but a lot of these I didn't know a lot about either. So I am a casual Elder Scrolls player. Yeah, because a lot of people play just because <laughs> the atmosphere and the storytelling is nice. You don't necessarily get into the deep lore like we do here. Right. Now, Boethia sounds like Bohemian. Is that related, or is it just... No, uh, okay. Boethia, other names. Father of Plots, Prince of Plots, Fount of Inspiration, Deceiver of Nation, Queen of Shadows. You see that there's, like, multiple... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Goddess of Destruction, He Who Destroys, She Who Erases. So it's like... <laughs> so that sounds like... For spies, assassins, Sphe people of the night. Sphere of influence. Conspiracy, deceit, unlawful overthrow of authority. Uh, definitely enjoyment in the suffering of mortals. So, yeah. yeah. That's that's gross already. <laughs> if I remember correctly, I don't remember this 100%. If I'm, 100, if I'm wrong, I'm sure uh, our friend uh, Aramithius will point it out. But I think in Skyrim, like part of the, part of the thing for Buitha is you have to sacrifice a follower. Oh. Like, like deceit. Like somebody that trusts you, you have to kill them. Yikes! Boethia's plane is called Attributions Share. Attributions Share. Yeah, okay. uh, the names get a little weird at times. That yes, because the planes are like the essence of the deity. Okay. So it's what they want to exude and be mm -hmm. perceived by, and like their their purest form is becomes their plane. Right. Uh, Attribution Share is one of the more recent names. Uh, it's been renamed numerous times by Boethia for... Eh, un no one knows. Uh, it's described as a country of labyrinthine policies and betrayals. I don't know what that means exactly. Uh, it is known to be full of maze gardens and twisted towers and just all sorts of stuff. Interesting note about the place is the realm is used to host a Tournament of the Ten Bloods. This was actually seen in one of the games. Oh, okay. uh, in which a champion is taken from each of the ten races of Tamriel and are pitted against each other in fights to the death for a Daedric artifact called Goldbrand, which is a sword. That sounds traumatizing. <laughs> yeah, Boethia is not a fun one. No. Boethia is portrayed as female in Arena, Daggerfall, and Skyrim, and as male in Morrowind and Oblivion. Always okay. in he always in like this ebony armor. Ooh, interesting. So, yeah. Okay. And each of these Daedric princes could have an episode for themselves. 
you know, they all have quests, they all have storylines, they all have right. whatever. And maybe we'll do that sometime. May- you know. Maybe. It's a, it, There's so much we could do with Elder Scrolls yeah. that, you know, it's so, hard to promise how much we can do. So um, I Definitely want to do, like, each of the eras. Yeah. But the individual... Some of these deities deserve, I think, an episode more than other ones do. That's fair. So, moving on, we have Clavicus Vile. Clavicus Vile. Sounds like the name of somebody from Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, I can see that a little bit, actually. Other names, God Child of the Morning Star. That's no, a Sorry, sorry. Name. Child God of the Morning Star. Child God of the Morning Star. And oh. the Prince of Bargains. The Prince of Bargains. Yeah. The Prince of Bargains is a really bad romance novel in my head. That's <laughs> that's where I'm at. His sphere is the granting of power through pacts and wishes. Okay. So kind of like Fae, because there's always this idea of the Fae making contracts. Definitely contract. has that look, um, going out of order a little bit, depicted a man with horns in his head. Mm-hmm. And, okay, like a satyr or yeah. something like that? Okay. Clive Vile's plane is the field of regret. Oh, because you made a bad contract. Ha ha. An idyllic countryside dotted with merchant utopias, fields of white clovers, woodland meadows, twisted foliage, odd melted looking places, the air smells of both perfume and rotting flesh. The sky is blue I'm not, with I'm not co- into that. <laughs> the sky is blue with cottony clouds and greenish gray streaks that stain the atmosphere. So basically it's he, very Faustian. Yeah. Very much, yeah. Duality like, <laughs> is very much part of this. Uh, yeah. Takes back his deals often, alters them, you know, pray I don't alter it further type stuff. Right. Um, or, or kind of a monkey paws wish thing is what I'm hearing. Right. Too. Toys with mortals a lot. He is one of the more tolerated princes, though, uh, generally speaking, amongst Tamriel. He is venerated by merchants, bankers, politicians, you know, people you would expect. <laughs> Yeah, okay. People who are profit-driven, yeah. Um, Interesting thing about this, this is the one that I kind of know because it's very famous in Skyrim. Uh, So Lesser Daedra are generally created by cutting off parts of your power, parts of yourself, whatever the the Daedric princes create Lesser Daedra. A very powerful Lesser Daedra in this case is called Barbus, who is a companion of Clavicus Viles most of the time, usually portrayed as a dog. And in fact, you can find this dog in Skyrim and reunite yeah, that's him. Right. Yeah, so you know, and he's a dog that a lot of people seem to like. <laughs> a lot of people don't even return him; they just keep him around because they like the dog. I I didn't know what was going on at first. I thought it was a cool thing because I I hadn't been exposed to lore that much in Oblivion when yeah. I played it. I just kind of ran around and did stuff. There's two dogs you can get in the game in Skyrim. Um, I believe. There's Barbus. Yes. There's Miko. Yeah. I want to say there's another one, but I'm not 100 percent sure. I think it's those two because Barbus and Miko look the same, but one talks to you, and yeah. one doesn't. I believe you can. I believe. Okay, I'm not 100 percent sure on this, but I believe the guy in Markarth who feeds his dog people. Oh. Because he says a line about like you like how my dogs attack. It's because I white I feed them, and you find out through one of the quests that he's a cannibal. So it's I I think. Not 100% sure on that either. I'm not sure if you can get that dog. I'm not convinced (laughs) of that one. I'm not convinced either. I want to say I might be right, but I don't know if I am. Uh, Yeah, I don't Uh, think you can get that dog. Moving on, one of my favorites, actually, Mm -hmm. um, is Hermanus Hermanus Mora. Hermanus Mora, okay. Other names are the Abyssal Cephalarch. Cephalarch. Cephalarch? Cephalarch. You want to practice these words next time a little bit more? I did, and it's hard. Words are hard. Well, here's the reason. It, here's the reason it's hard. It's it's not a real. I don't think it's a real word. No, of course not. Its root is obviously based on cephalopod. It's a bunch of tentacles. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that's kind of where it's coming from. But uh, uh, abyssal, whatever, demon of knowledge, the golden eye, the inevitable knower, the antecedent, woodland man. That was a weird one to find. Uh, the gardener of men, the wretched abyss. The gardener of men. I also like Woodland Man. Like, Woodland Man! Yeah. Those two I'll have to get into when we get into different pantheons. I believe Woodland Man is Nordic? Maybe? No no promises here, guys. We're not talking Um, about that yet. Yeah. That'll be when we get to the individual pantheons, which I do think would be worth it. Okay. So, Hermanus Moore's sphere is fate, knowledge, learning, memory. Okay. Uh, Basically, if if it is stuff that people know, he wants to know it. Okay. Um, All right. His plane is Apocrypha. Okay. 
Okay. The, <laughs> as if Atris wrote this one. It's kind of fun. It's an endless ocean. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Though Atris wouldn't write this one. Right. Because it is an ocean of toxic green lake where we're jively ointy tentacles slither about and writhe in the waves and whip at anyone who gets too close to them. Akinar would write this one. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> if he could write. Yeah. But he can't. Oh. Oh, no. People are going to be tuning in for the Elder Scrolls cast. Like, who the hell is Akinar? Who is Akinar? <laughs> Listen to episodes one and two. Yeah, which is not Elder Scrolls related before you think it's that. Buildings jut out from the ocean like daggers through cloth. This is actually my analogy at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, they're connected by constantly shifting bridges built of greasy black metal. Uh, several bridges and hallways even move on their own. So it's really a weird place. You go here in um, the Skyrim DLC Dragonborn. Okay. And it is a weird place. I kind of like it a lot, though, because everything, like almost every surface is covered with, like the walls are covered with books and scrolls and there's paper all over the floor yeah. and there's just knowledge everywhere. It sounds kind of gross, but it also is in a sense of a setting. It sounds really interesting and unique. Yeah. Uh, I, I really like it. It's really creepy. There's like these weird, like, mon- like, uh, what they're called, uh, seekers, I believe, who are like these weird floating things with many eyes. They look like, uh... Do they look like a beholder? No, they look like a mind flare almost. Like a okay. mi- like a floating, like a mind flare that is less poised. <laughs> okay. And dried out. <laughs> okay, so mummy mind flares, okay. Um, this one is also kind of genderless, uh, speaks with a male voice in your head. Okay. But uh, it looks like a Lovecraftian horror of tentacles and floating eyeballs with one large eyeball in the center. Now that'll make you go blind. I mean... <laughs> in fact, one of the reasons I like this one so much is the way you f- meet him in Sky... Um, is it... Is it default Skyrim or, or Dawnguard? I can't remember. But I think it's regular Skyrim. Is... There's this guy from the College of Winterhold who's kind of his servant, and he is just completely nuts. Right. Like, he has seen so much knowledge that his brain is broken. Again, this is kind of like the dangers of Necronomicon and that. Uh, in fact, <laughs> Necronomicon is kind of what you open. There's a thing called the Black Book. When you open it, you gain, like, knowledge. You basically gain skill points through the Black Books. Yeah. <laughs> but let's move on to her scene. Her scene? Okay. Her scene. That's uh, an easy name. Yeah, Huntsman of Princes, Father of Man Beast, Lord of the Hunt, the Hungry Cat, which is what the Khajiit call him. Okay, Father of Man Beast sounds like he's been he's been doing a lot of Zeus like activities, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, not that I could find. Uh, his sphere is the Hunt. Okay. His plane is called the Hunting Grounds. Do you get a theme here? <laughs> yes, I do. But uh, this feels more like. Battle Royale the Hunt to me than, say, um, Artemis the Hunt. It is, it, it actually is a little bit more Artemis the Hunt. Okay. From all, for, for what most people say, uh, this is one of the few that is considered a, you know, most of these are considered evil, good or evil. He is considered very fair. Okay. The plane of the hunting grounds is dense forest and, vla- and vast, vast plains, vast plains. Huge tracts of land? Huge tracts of land. Okay. Uh, mortals who enter these realms are typically hunted down by the inhabitants. Yeah, that's why I was which thinking are, Battle well, Royale. <laughs> uh, here's the thing, though. It's not... It, yes and no. The inhabitants are bears, wolves, were-creatures, daedra, and mm. all the animals are bigger than back on Nern. So they're all, like, dire bears and stuff. Oh, okay. um, Anyone with lycanthropy, which would be werewolves, werebears, werebores, werelions, and werecrocodiles, who die, spend all eternity in the hunting grounds, as lycanthropy is a gift, quote-unquote, oh, right. from her scene. Right. Uh, gift or curse, obviously, depending I, on who you look at it. I've had a character become a werewolf. Um, yeah. But uh, considered one of the fairer princes, all his hunts are fair. There's always a sporting chance. Okay. And he uh, even throws adulation on prey who are able to turn the hunt to their favor. Ooh, okay. So, yeah, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, very fair. Yeah, okay. Depicted as a male humanoid with uh, animal head and, like, great antlers. Mm. From his appearance in Morrowind, it seems he... Uh, there's only two appearances I could find. Uh, from his appearance in Morrowind, it seems to have somewhat of a bestial skin. It had, like, spots on it and stuff. Okay. So, but we'll move on. I'm going to skip... Okay, so I was going in alphabetical order. I'm skipping the one called uh, Jigalag. Jigalag we'll talk about next episode, so... Jigalag is kind of tied with Sheogorath. They kind of go hand in hand, so it makes sense to com- talk about them both at the same time. Okay, so, so we'll do that. We'll do that. So to keep stay tuned next 
episode for, for that. For Jigalag. Right? We'll get to Malakath, the one that the weird one, the one that was... Yeah, the one yeah. who's excreted after <laughs> he was swallowed. Uh, interesting. So he, I think that kind of plays into this a little bit. So oh, creator of curses, master of curses, keeper of oaths. Keeper of oaths. So wait, how does... But he was... Cre- okay, never mind. I, I, well, I just, okay, so... I'm very confused by all of this. It, well, so his sphere is the spurned, the sworn oath, the bloody curse, basically the ostracized. The ostracized are okay. are his thing. He is the patron god of the Orsimer, uh, and therefore, you know, all the orcs kind of worship him, or most of the orcs, I shouldn't say, okay. but orcs kind of worship him. And of course, some call that story about the Ethier eating Trinamac yeah. as anti-orc propaganda. Oh. Um, okay. And we'll cover Trinamac and Malakath in greater detail when we discuss the Morethic era or the orcs in their own episode. Right. But there's multiple ways you can look about how Malakath came to be. In some stories, it was he overcame great odds and, you know, was deceived by a bar, you know, all this stuff. So um, there's multiple stories. and So essentially, it was because he had a trick turned on him. That's why he represents these these groups. Um, His plane is the Ash Pit. The Ash Pit. The Ash Pit consists of nothing but dust, ash, and smoke. There is no ground, sky, or air. So are you just floating in it? I don't think we've ever been there in the games. One book, The Doors of Oblivion, describes palaces of smoke and vaporous creatures. I was going to say, if there was nothing created in a specific shape, this was starting to sound really lazy for somebody who wanted to create something. <laughs> it was just kind of like, well, if I mash everything up and it kind of is this amorphous kind of blob, you can exist in that, right? Go. The, this Spartan landscape, ash and sky, and you know, is kind of like... A good thing in orc religion. It's where orcs who revere Malakath reside in a place called the Ashen Forge. Okay. And it's a place of perpetual feasting and drinking and battle where every orc is a chief and has many wives because orcs are very sexist. Uh, yikes, guys. <laughs> so much yikes. Which is funny because one of my favorite characters in the game is... The wife of the orc chieftain, not the chieftain. He's a bit of an <laughs> Despite his ferocity, like, he loves battle and stuff, but despite his ferocity, Malakath is generally caring towards his followers. Okay. He wants them to do well. He punishes orc chiefs for cowardice or failing to properly lead. Okay. Oh, so there are must be flat surfaces in places where things exist if they have a whole feasting day. I'm still caught up on this idea of I it's think just you have to kind of. Dust. I think you have to think of it more as it's a place where non-corporeal things can be. Okay. All right. That is my, that was how I would look at it. Like wraiths and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Depicted an orcish male in a loincloth with a huge sword. All right. No Classic. Classic. <laughs> so, uh, and then we get to one that's actually, people might know pretty well, is um, Mehrunes Dagon. Mehrunes Dagon, okay. Lord of Razors, Prince of Destruction, Spheres Destruction, Revolution, okay. Change. Okay. Destruction, Revolution, Change. Yeah. You've probably seen the plane that he is responsible for called the Deadlands. It is an inhospitable nightmare of lava and molten rock pocked with islands where Dagon's servants, the Dromora, carry out his works in immense spike towers. The sky is perpetually storming and it's always red and burning and yeah, it's... It's the place you see in Oblivion when you go to Oblivion. Right, exactly. He is responsible for the invasion of Tamil during the Oblivion Crisis, as we just mentioned. He is the foe of all mortal races. He sees Nurn as a plane of Oblivion that should be his. <laughs> oh, so any place that's mortal is because since he likes change, he wants to yeah. keep changing it. Um, he's trying to invade numer- He's tried to invade Tamriel numerous times and has almost succeeded on at least two occasions. Yikes. That's, that's what we call a, a crisis, people. Yeah. Oh, uh, man. He is depicted as a four-armed male demon, usually okay. red. So right, red. So very much feeding into the stereotypical demon like. Yeah, he even has horns look. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Dagon being done, let's move on to Mephala, who is web spinner, the spinner, spider. Suddenly, I'm just thinking of the stereotypical D and D drow goddess, the spider. A little lady. bit. Yeah. Uh, that's definitely how she's per- per, uh, depicted. Is you know with. The, the a spider body sometimes or with legs or a web you know it's okay yeah. um her sphere is lies sex and secret murder 
That doesn't sound like fun sex, though. That no. sounds like Black Widow sex. <laughs> Defo- uh, usually if she is depicted in a dress, it is black with a Black Widow, like, red diamond type thing Ooh. on it. So That sounds like a great Halloween costume. Um, yeah. Her plane is called the Spiral Skein. S-K-E-I-N, also okay. known as Mephala's Web. And I kind of like this one. It kind of sa- it, it sounds very much like Dante a little bit. So I'm going to read through the read an actual poetic, like, actual description from the game. Oh, okay, cool. Um, it's uh, from the book Rumors of the Spiral Skein, which is in Elder Scrolls Online. I'm not going to read the whole thing. We're going to start with the description. In its center is a tower, the Pillar Palace of Mephala, whose true name is too awful to be uttered. Ooh. Spun round this pillar, like spokes, are the eight strands of the skein, to each its own space, and to each space its sin. Okay. First is a cavern of plinths and pedestals. Each is a lie, for they pretend to hold up the sky, and the sky is the greatest lie of all. The sky is the greatest lie of all. Okay, Chicken Little. Second are the chambers of envy, for compared to the cavern above, they are cramped and confined, and therefore they hate the cavern. They hate the cavern, but the sky is a lie. Third are the grottos, alluring and seductive, for their walls and ceilings glow like a million stars that sing a song of love, but the glowing lights are maggots, and the song they sing is decay. I can dig it. That's that's fine. I'm cool with that. I saw an image of that one. I was like, oh, that looks nice. Oh, (laughs) <laughs> that sounds like something that exists in the movie Pitch Black, which I really like the movie Pitch Black, even though it's trashy. <laughs> Fourth are the tunnels of fear, for they are eternally dark, and where there is darkness, there is dread. Sometimes. Okay. Fifth are the halls where fair is foul and foul is fair, and every belief is a betrayal. Okay, up is down, right is left, cats and dogs living together. Oh, dear. Six is the arena of murder. Forever shall betrayal be followed by murder. Betrayal shall be followed by murder. Yeah. So, essentially, keep keep true, jerks. Seventh are the arcades of avarice and appetite, for contain therein are all things mortals would kill or die for. Kill or die for. So, things like true love, love of a child. Lots of other lots stuff, of too. money and... and, and I think it's and more. Desires, yeah. Yeah. Uh, eighth is the flaming skein of fury. For as death comes to all mortals, therefore all treasures are lies. I like that one. All treasures are lies. Yeah. Because um, that's, that's true. If you can't keep it with you, then what's, yeah. what's the point? I just love that description. It's kind of a cool description. And it kind of sets out like the, mul- the, the rings of hell almost type yeah. thing. Yeah. That, um, that is pretty cool. Um, I hope nobody might have had a comment for all of them, because they, they, it, is, it is a pretty awesome idea yeah. that the sky being a lie is just like, I was already like, <laughs> uh, I'm going to call that one out. That doesn't sound right to me. <laughs> That's fine. Mephala actually is, the one thing I do remember from Skyrim is that she is part of a quest called this, the, I think it's called the Whispering Door. Okay. And they cut this. She kind of tries to make one of the kids of the Jarl of Whiterun okay. kill the Jarl. Like, like, the Jarl is potentially able to die before they cut the content. Like, wow. that was Mephala's doing, and I think they stopped it because it would have been a little too weird. <laughs> okay. Moving on from Mephala, we have Meridia, the Glister Witch, Lady of Infinite Energies, Lady of Light. Her sphere is living things. Living things. I think I remember there was an... There was a mission that if you, in certain Skyrims, um, you would get to a point where you would follow this quest for Meridia, and then you weren't able to finish it. it a new out. hand, a new hand touches the beacon, yeah. And then you're kind of just stuck up in the sky. I tried it three times. Oh, it glitched it like, for you? It glitched, it started, and three times, and then suddenly I was just walking on the sky, and I said... This. You're supposed to be in the sky, but it glitched and she didn't talk to you then. No, so. she did not talk to me. Um, I missed the whole my favorite gl- of plot. My favorite glitch I saw in that game was somebody got taken up in the sky and there was a dragon there. <laughs> Oopsies! <laughs> Sorry, um, uh, that was not planned. She is one of the good ones. Uh, okay. She was originally one of the Magna Ghee, mm-hmm. and but you know part of that is still kind of... She's one of the good ones. She cares for all the living people of Tamriel. She hates vampires and those who abu- abuse... Or corrupt her life-giving energy like necromancers okay. and all that stuff. Her plane is called the Colored Rooms. 
there's not many descriptions of this place actually. Um, okay. I think you see it once. In, um, I want to say online, I could be wrong about that. Yeah, and the colored rooms is such a vague description. Right. The little bit we do see of it kind of reminds me of Mist. Not Mist like the game, but like the series. Okay. Um, it's a series of islands floating. It looked like it was in an ocean, but the ocean stopped, and then it was a sea of clouds. Oh, interesting. And there's, um, like weird like spouts of water out in the distance, and strange light coming out of rocks and everything and mm -hmm. weird plants it was at once very beautiful looking and very alien ah, so okay. very mist like at least later games of mist as they started getting better technology but yeah she is uh she is one of the good ones and the one that most people probably know from skyrim as the one who has her beacon that shouts in your ear when you touch it uh she's ah. depicted kind of angelic with uh, arms raised and uh yeah uh, female with robes yeah so that's what I remember going to before it called me to the sky and then the freaking <laughs> mission glitched. So that's where we're going to stop it for now because yeah. there's seven to go, eight with Jigalag, so... Yes. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's a little shorter than, than a book. We couldn't have gone through everything. It would have been too long. And, it it would and, have been a 90-minute episode, and that's a bit too long for us to record. <laughs> but we appreciate you hanging in there. And as always, reach out. At lore together at twitter.com, lore together at gmail.com. And on Patreon at patreon.com slash lore together, where you Yay. can join us to get early access to episodes and watch our streams and Eventually, tell us. Yeah, tell us what we should work on next. I yeah. mean, well, probably not next, but. Well, eventually. Yeah. We're, we're going to take a list of things and we might have some votes between one. Was Mystic yeah. decides what he's researching between one or the other. And we'll talk about maybe some other things we can add to the Patreon eventually. So Yay! Well, thanks for tuning in. Don't forget, Daedra Part 2 is next week, and then after that... Next we'll... episode. Next episode, excuse so me. So in two weeks. So in two weeks. Next yes. week we'll be on our stream again, which will be Skyrim again. Yes, exactly. So Daedra Part 2 is next episode. Mm -hmm. Join us then. Otherwise, uh, that's it. I'm ready to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Bye.